all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Father, I thank you for this word. Thank you for this truth. I thank you for this history. I pray, Lord God, as we speak about this dear child that was born, that every heart and mind will be open to hear what the Lord can do for our lives as the Messiah, as the Savior, as the Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, of course, this is Christmas Eve and everyone will have their various uh, traditions that you will either express, carry on during the night and some things on into in the, in the morning. I think Luke chapter 2 uh, is, is probably one of the most clearest, I guess fullest accounts of what's happening in the Christmas story. And uh, it's the one, if you grew up like me watching uh, Charlie Brown, Brown Christmas, it was actually Luke chapter 2 that Linus would get up and, and, um, and recite. But, you know, when we have been looking at leading up to the birth in the messages last week, the messages this morning, leading up to the birth, starting with, of course, the initial announcement to Zacharias that he was going to have a son and his wife was going to have a child in her old age, even though she was barren and that that child would be the forerunner uh, of the Messiah that was to come. That was good news for them because obviously they had been looking for a Messiah uh, for generations, thousands of years. And finally to get the message that Zacharias is here and that your son is gonna be the forerunner. It didn't totally indicate when the child would be born, but it certainly let him know, okay, this is really happening. And then the next scene we see is the angel Gabriel also going to Mary and telling Mary that you are indeed are gonna carry this child, this Messiah. She was a young child, a young girl, and a young lady preparing for marriage, was a virgin, had uh, never been with a man. So she asks a question about that, how can this be? And the angel tells her that it'll be the work of the Holy Spirit, but indeed you will bring forth a son, the Messiah, the Christ. The same angel, though, had to go talk to Joseph, who was in another place, and let him know that Mary, the one that you're engaged to, is having a child. It's not yours. Not your child, but Mary hasn't done anything wrong. But he's going to bring forth a child, and she's going to bring forth a child, and that child's name shall be Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. And then this morning, we looked at Elizabeth and Mary actually meeting together to talk about, to share about what actually had taken place. One of the things that come out of this uh, story is the sovereign plan of God and how God is able to orchestrate things that we don't see, to bring about things that we may not even be aware of for the good of all mankind. Those first seven verses bring this up. And I also like to point out, and I guess it just depends upon what translation you use. And in mine, it says, in those days, uh, there's other translations that say, and it came to pass. You notice it doesn't say once upon a time, because this is not a fairy tale. This is not a fable. This is not a story. This is absolute history, history that can be documented, history that was documented, sorry, history that can be proven. As a matter of fact, I think the reason it even uses the name of Quirinius, because you can, you can look and find out when he was the governor of Syria, that he was a real person <clears throat> overseeing a real land under the control of the Romans, and here is when all of this takes place. It's, it's, a, it's a tale of, 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 of a few uh, key people, a, story, a narrative of a few uh, key people, but all of it is sovereignly orchestrated by God. God planned this. This has been part of God's plan since Adam and Eve was born. Actually, the scripture tells us even before the foundation of the world. And God made preparation, and he's so sovereign, though, that he can bring everything into place. There's so many things that God is doing in your life right now that he started a long time ago, and you just walked into the sovereign plan of God. 
Some of you might even thought that you're here by accident. Maybe you came because the wife said or the husband said or come on children, it's, it's Christmas Eve. I, I got news for you. God orchestrated that before you were born. You weren't here just because you said yes at the right time. You're here because that's what God decreed for your life. And he, and he does things like that so often. I so much now think more about uh, the children of Israel when they were going across the, uh, the Jordan River that was over flooded. And God stopped the water 20 miles down the road to prepare for them to have the victory walking across the dry ground. For some of you, God done some things 20 days ago, 20 months ago, 20 years ago. And you walked right into the blessing and the goodness of the Almighty God without you even being part of it. That's what I like about God. He does, does so many things that we can't take credit for because he does it without our permission, without having a business meeting, without checking our calendar. God just is God, and I'm so glad that he is. And here, just think about this, this sovereign plan here. For this to work out at exactly at the time that it did, there had to be a census call during the time when Mary was pregnant. Now, it was not uncommon for the Romans to call census of the people because they were, they were the authority over the land at the time, uh, ruling the empire. And it was not uncommon for them to call a census. But they didn't have a necessary specific time they called them. They just called them when they thought the time was right, when things was in place. And here in this particular case, they just so happened to call a census when Mary was pregnant. Also, what had to be orchestrated is that the one who was going to be the, the personal father over uh, Jesus had to be one that was from uh, the house of David, which means then that he had to go to Bethlehem to register because every male had to go to the home of their lineage. The home of the household of Joseph was Bethlehem. That was the, the birthplace and the, uh, where the lineage of David uh, 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 extended from. Bethlehem means the house of bread. I don't think it's uh, a coincidence that the bread of life comes from the house of, house of bread also. But, but he, had to, he had to come from Bethlehem. Also, it had to come at a time when Mary was due. It was not necessarily the woman did not have to go. The family didn't have to go. Only the male had to go and register for the census. But Joseph recognized that Mary was so close to being due that he thought it would be better for her to go with him to Bethlehem. But it also just so happens that 715 years before Jesus was born, in the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, it was declared there that in the house of Bethlehem, though you are small among the princes of Judah, yet out of you will come the one whom God has anointed. 715 years before Jesus was born, it was declared that the Messiah, the Savior, will be born in Bethlehem. Now, I would say this. I would go as dare to say with my... Uh, creative thinking, that the Romans might have thought maybe we should change the census at another time, but they couldn't because God had ordained it. Maybe, maybe Joseph could have thought, you know what, Mary, I know it's close, but maybe you better stay, but he couldn't because God had ordained it. God had ordained sovereignly that all of this will converge together so that when, Mary, when that census was called, Mary would be due, they would have to go to Bethlehem, and it fulfills all of the prophecy of the Scripture that this child would be born in the city of Bethlehem. That's why I love my God and I love my Bible, because my Bible is a Bible full of prophecies that God proves over and over and over that He has fulfilled. He's a God that keeps His promise, and there's one thing God cannot do, He cannot lie. He's a God that keeps his word, can you say amen? So sure enough, Jesus is in Bethlehem in the womb of Mary at a time when there's no place where he could be, his head can be laid, and they just put him in a place where some, uh, a, a manger or a place where they feed the animals was cut out of some rock, and there where Jesus was lying. The King of kings and the Lord of lords 
is in a backdrop of humiliation, a backdrop of, of shame, not only for his mother, but also for him. But that's the same Jesus that came into this world in humiliation and to the eyes of the world went out in humiliation on the cross. But that's the meaning of Christmas, that this God and Savior will come to a level of you and I. He enters right into our world. He came where we were living, sinful people, separated from God, had a mindset to reject God and not to be uh, obedient to him and reverent to him. God could have looked down upon every one of us and says, they don't love me, I don't need to love them. But God wrapped himself up in humiliation and shame and allowed himself to be placed in a manger and die on a cross so every one of us can have eternal life. That's Christmas. But we got these fellows, the shepherds. Verses 8 and, and through 18 brings out the story of them. They were just doing their normal thing. Now, this morning I shared with you about the, the various ladies, the ladies of ill repute, the ladies of shame, the ladies uh, that was in the genealogy of Jesus, and none of them had a, a great story except the fact Christ redeemed them. They redeemed by our God. How they weren't looked upon as, as the most uh, reverent people in the community. Well, neither were the shepherds. Actually, shepherds were some of the lowliest people uh, on the land. They, they, they could not mix themselves up among uh, the normal crowd because they were considered unclean because of the work that they did and the things that they did. Shepherds was not given a place to be good witnesses. They were mostly considered men of ill repute and liars and thieves and etc. But once again, the Lord proves that he comes to the lowly. He comes to the weak. He comes to those who are not looked upon with such great grandeur. He's a God that's not looking for people with big names and big status. He's not looking for people who are celebrities, people who are rich, people who have notoriety. God is always looking to use just ordinary people like you and I. And here he comes to these shepherds. And the, the scripture says that we, well, we get the sense it was night because of the brightness. Of course, the song Silent Night, Holy Night comes from that. But here indeed, the angel comes. The scripture does not tell us who this angel is. We believe it's Gabriel because Gabriel was the, the angel that gave messages. But the scripture says that he comes and then there's the radiance of the Lord's glory that surrounds these shepherds. They're people that know the night, they know the land, they know the sky, they know the weather, they know what's happening. So this was an odd thing to them. This was an unusual thing, that this light would just shine brightly. And of course, there this angel is in the middle of this, this light. And of course, they were terrified. But he says to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people, the Savior. Yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, uh, to the, in the highest heaven, peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And so the shepherds get this witness, they get this message, they hear this song, which is a song we'll sing in, uh, in just a moment. They realize that they've been chosen by God to be the witnesses of him. He, they're told that, listen, there's a, a significant one born this night. While you're out here watching your sheep, there's a significant person being born. He is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the Savior. He's the one that's bringing peace to the earth, peace to the world. He's the one that's doing so. Again, another fulfillment of prophecy. In Jeremiah chapter 33, we see the prophecy that the announcement of the she of, to the shepherds would come. Jeremiah 33, 13 through 16, it says, once again, shepherds will count their flocks in the towns of the hill country, the foothills of Judah, the Negev, the land of Benjamin, the vicinity of Jerusalem, and all the towns of Judah. I, the Lord, have spoken. The day will come, says the Lord, when I will do for Israel and Judah all the good things I promised them. In those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will do what is just and right throughout the land. In that day, Judah will be saved, 
and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this will be its name. The Lord is our righteousness. And so there again, 700 years or so, uh, maybe a little bit more than 700 years, there's that prophecy that the shepherds will be out in the field and they will hear the message of the righteous one. Again, pointing to the, to the uh, efficiency of, of Scripture and of prophecy. And they're told that it is the Savior who's born. They give, him his, they give his name and they give it with significance. You'll notice that every time it's talked about Jesus being born, his name is given and the reason, the purpose, the significance of his birth. Now, we don't normally do that. We don't normally, when we name our children and we let everybody know that we have a child, we don't necessarily say, hey, folks, uh, my son George is born and, and, and George is going to be the one that's going to invent the rocket. Uh, my, my son is born and his name is Wilbur. Matter of fact, I got Wilbur, Wilbur and Orville and they're going to teach people how to fly. We don't necessarily do that. I doubt when John Hancock was born in Massachusetts that his parents called family and friends and say, listen, everybody, we got a son, we're naming him John Hancock, and he's going to have the most famous signature in the world. I doubt that. I doubt when George Washington Carver was born that there in Missouri in that small town, they said, hey, folks, listen, our son is born, we're naming him George Washington Carver, and he's going to teach you how to use peanuts in 300 different ways. I doubt that. As a matter of fact, for most of us, when we're born, there's celebration, but the significance of our life is not necessarily known. But for Jesus, his significance was distinguished. He was told that he would be the Savior, and his name would be Jesus. Why? Because he will save the world from their sins. He will be called the Christ. Why? Because he is the Messiah. So Jesus' name had significance. He's not just a boy. As a matter of fact, Talladega Knights, they're still talking about the baby Jesus. No, we're, about, we're beyond the baby Jesus. We know that this Jesus is the creator of the universe. He's the maker of the heaven and the earth. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the first and the last. He's a God of righteousness. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the supreme over all. He is the Savior and the Savior of the world. That's the Son, Jesus, that's come into the world. The Scripture tells us that He is the Prince of Peace. He brings peace to mankind. He brings peace because He's able to forgive us. He's a God of peace to those who trust Him, to those who look to Him, to those who revere Him. There's a peace that comes into our life from the Holy Spirit. There's a peace that comes to us that we can have peace to mankind. There's a peace that is with us because we can live our life peacefully. He's the one that brings that peace. He's the one that brings that joy because he's a significant child. Well, here the shepherds hear that. Not only do they hear that message, but they also hear that he tells them, this is how you can know that the child was born. If you go to Bethlehem, you're going to find him, and he's going to be in a manger. So they understand that this is just not a message. Now, i got to tell you, it took courage for them to leave where they were, to leave the sheep, to leave the field, and go into the city. Remember, again, that they're people of ill repute, that people don't have regard for them and respect for them, and they're not to come into places where they can have to be identified as being unclean. But they realized something magnificent was happening. And again, the sovereign work of the Lord because Jeremiah 33 had already prophesied that they would be witnesses. So indeed, they go into the city and there they describe what happened. They tell Mary what happened. They tell Mary what the song was. They tell Mary what the message was. They tell Mary what the angel had told them. And this brings me to my, to my last point about that. Because to me, this is part of probably the most significant thing for all of us during this evening. And it's in verse 19 and 20. And team, you can, you can come. It said, Mary kept all these, these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as it was that the angel had told them. For every one of us, what we see of Mary and what we see of the shepherds 
is what our posture should be about Christmas. Mary pondered these things in her heart. She didn't understand everything about Jesus. She knew what his name would be. She knew what significance that may meant, but she didn't know all the details of how this was going to be fulfilled, how this was going to work out. Mary had no more understanding of the crucifixion than the disciples did. Mary knew that my son was born to save uh, Israel, but she had no idea how that salvation would come about. She saw Jesus do things over the years, and she kept pondering. She would hear Jesus say things, and she pondered. She would hear messages, and she pondered. This word ponder in the Greek, it means a person who is puzzled by what they have heard, but keeps it in mind in order to understand, often with divine help that the meaning may apply to their life. Mary done what many of us should do. I, I know for a fact there's a whole lot of people on this planet, people you know, people even in this house right now. You've heard about Jesus. You knew Jesus was born. You believed that Jesus lived, and many people believe that Jesus died on the cross. There's others that even believe, that haven't trusted him, that believe he rose from the dead. But they haven't taken the time to really ponder what that means for their life. What does Jesus really mean for you? Who, does, who is Jesus truly to you? Have you pondered this Jesus when you're in the midst of tribulation to know that he's a God that's able to rescue you? Have you pondered him when you're in the midst of anxiety or worry? Or have you got so overwhelmed with your worry and the crisis in your life that you haven't allowed this Jesus, whom we're to ponder, to be the one that's able to bring peace to the storm of your life? Have you been in situations in your life where you thought there's no help and no hope? Or have you pondered that this Jesus comes to the hopeless and he comes to the helpless? I think many people who are on the process of trying to learn what to do with Jesus bail out before they get to that point of understanding. I just want to share with you, don't bail out on the process of pondering him. You may not know everything that Jesus can do for your life. Maybe there's some things about Jesus you're not sure you can trust yet. Maybe there's some things about Jesus you don't understand. But can I encourage you? Keep on pondering him. Keep thinking about him. Keep your mind stayed upon him. Watch what Jesus does in the course of your life. With all of the hustle and bustle that goes on during Christmas season, when we rush into Christmas and maybe rush out of Christmas, do you ponder what it truly, truly means and how this Jesus can indeed be the person that's the center of your life? and the center of your family, the center of your business, the center in the boardroom. Can you ponder this Jesus and discover who he really, really is? And then there's the action of the shepherds because the scripture says they went away praising him. They went away praising and magnifying God. And I think that actually is the second best response to Jesus is to praise. Praise always goes along with ponder. We used to sing a song in the old church, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he does for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I think the more you ponder about Jesus, the more you want to praise him. The more you think about what he's done for you, the more you want to shout hallelujah and give him thanks. These shepherds praise the Lord. And we, we do it with songs, we do it with the, with the Christmas carols, you can do it with scripture, you can do it with prayer, but I believe the right response is to constantly and consistently bring Jesus into a place in your life where you ponder who he is to you and how you to respond to that, which I hope ends with praise. For so many folks, tomorrow is Christmas, and I'm assuming that you've already done all the physical preparations. Matter of fact, most of us probably do what we're going to do in on, on Christmas Eve. But as the night closes, I just, I just want to ask you, have you really prepared your heart spiritually for Christmas? Beyond the food, beyond the tamales, the pasolis, we might be having some black eyed peas. Beyond the black eyed peas, be, beyond those, those things, the gifts, beyond the hamica, beyond the eggnog, have you really prepared your heart spiritually for Jesus? Is it just another Christmas because this is what we do on Christmas? We get together as a family, we open gifts, and we laugh and tell stories. Or is it a Christmas that's really centered around Jesus, that we really understand the reason for the season? Will you go to bed tonight pondering what Jesus really means to you? Will you wake up in the morning pondering 
what Jesus really means to you. Will you celebrate tomorrow with family and friends and remember that Jesus was the greatest gift that's ever been given to us? I want to close with the words from the angels again in more of a common vernacular. Because certainly you can't read Luke chapter 2 and not walk away with the true meaning of Christmas. They said this, the angel said this, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. In Yuma, Arizona, is he Christ the Lord to you? In Somerton, is he Christ the Lord? In San Luis, is he Christ the Lord? In Welton, is he Christ the Lord? This day, our Savior was born. Is he your Savior? One thing the Scripture tells us in John chapter 1 is that this God came and tabernacled with us. God with us. When I hear that verse, every time I read that verse, I'm telling you this is what comes in my mind. He's my God, and he's your God too. He came to live with you.